Well, have you ever wanted to change? Have you ever wanted to be someone other than who you are or something other than who you are, to be other than what you now are, to not feel the things that you now feel, to not think about things the way you think about things, or to not do the things that you find yourself doing? Have you ever desired to have your desires be different, only to come up against the obstacle of yourself, to come up against the wall of you, the tyranny of the sin-shattered self? Now, I would venture to guess that we all have in some way or another felt these things. So how is it that we change? How can we be more than who we are? How can we undergo deep change? Well, an ancient conversation held under the cover of darkness sheds light on some things that we need light shed upon. And as we go into this sermon here where we're going further into the Apostles' Creed, uh, it's important for us to understand uh, a few things. Now, um, this Apostles' Creed that we are digging into, um, in case you're new and you're wondering what is, what is in Apostles' Creed, well, the Apostles' Creed is an ancient global statement of faith that, that holds within it key elemental truths of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. So it's a statement that says, you know, I believe, and then there's a number of things. And the I believe doesn't just mean I have these thoughts in my head. It means I'm entrusting my life to this God that I'm proclaiming. And so in the Apostles' Creed, um, we have seen that it is Trinitarian shaped. In other words, uh, the form of the creed is shaped by or echoes um, God's Trinitarian nature. And what is that? It means God is one and three, three and one. One God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this, this glorious mystery that there's no way I can unravel and explain. But we see the creed is shaped in a Trinitarian way. So we have seen and explored how the scriptures say that uh, God is Father Almighty. He's the creator of heaven and the creator of earth. And we have seen by looking at the creed and exploring the scriptures that Jesus Christ is his son, our only Lord. And today we are going to look at the third person of the Holy Spirit. And that takes us to the third section of the creed. And so the creed invites us to say, I believe in the Holy Spirit. But what, or rather, who is the Holy Spirit? What's the Holy Spirit like? How does the Holy Spirit operate? What should our relationship be with the Holy Spirit? Because in short, there's a great deal of understanding, or rather misunderstanding, haunting uh, sanctuaries and churches all across the world about who the Holy Spirit is and, and what he does. And to be honest, you start talking about the Holy Spirit, people can, can get a little twitchy and be like, I, I'm not comfortable with this or that, I, I'm not... I'm not okay with this. And so um, what we're going to be doing today is, is looking at a conversation that sheds a lot of light on who this spirit is. And, and it's important that we do because this isn't a minor issue. Like this, is, this is big stuff. Right? This is a big deal because in short, there's no Christianity without the Holy Spirit. There's no Christian without the Holy Spirit. So again, if you would indulge me, An ancient conversation held under the cover of darkness will shed some light on some things that need light shed upon them. And this story comes to us from the glorious chapter of the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. And this is a story of a man named Nick and Jesus. So let's talk about Jesus and Nick. Now, when we approach the story, the sun has gone down. And the deepening blues and and green golds of the sunset have given away to the cover of night. It's all dark except where there is a flicker of oil lamps and homes and some torches spread out through the city. And through the darkness and through the streets winds Nicodemus. Now, this man is something of a celebrity among the Jewish people. Not Jesus, I mean Nick. 
He's a theologian par excellence. He has two PhDs in, in Bible. He holds tenure and he holds honor in the top rabbinical Ivy League school of the day. Like, everybody knows him. When he goes through the streets, the kids are like, it's Nick. There he goes. So this teacher goes to call on Jesus. And this teacher, when he calls on Jesus, he calls Jesus rabbi. He calls Jesus teacher. So the teacher of Israel calls Jesus teacher. Now clearly, Professor Nick holds a level of respect for this non-Ivy League Jesus from this backwater town called Nazareth. This Jesus who's been causing this incredible stir, who's at the center of rumors and reports and speculations that have been rumbling throughout the land. See, Nicodemus can't deny the light that is in the life of this Jesus, so he seeks him out. He says, Rabbi, teacher, we know that you're a teacher from God. We, we know it uh, because only somebody from God can do the signs, to do, can do the things that you do. They have to be from God to do those things, so we know you're from him. And then Jesus uh, in the most Jesus-y kind of answer, in an odd and almost disconnected fashion, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. See, Jesus knows where Nicodemus is going with this conversation, and Jesus knows exactly what he wants to teach this, this Nicodemus. And so he presses into the heart of it, and he says, look, Nicodemus, you, you have to be born again. You have to be born again to enter into God's kingdom. You, you need to be given a new heart, like a brand new nature. That, that's the only way forward. And then, of course, this, this short circuits Nicodemus' brilliant brain. And, and he, goes, he says, wait, 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 wait. How can a man be born again when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born? Like, this makes no sense. I cannot go in utero again and start over. And then Jesus explains. He says, no, no, Nick, not in utero. In spirit. In spirit. And then Jesus says this in verses six through eight. He says, truly, truly, and that is a way of putting in bold, highlighting, asterisks around that underline, saying, pay attention, this, this is important stuff. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So in short, he says, Nick, you, you need to be changed from the inside out from above. You need the Spirit of the living God living within you. It's only the Spirit of God that brings life from death, light from from darkness, order from chaos. See, this is so important because what Jesus is teaching us is that to be a, a follower of Jesus, to be an apprentice of Jesus, to be a Christian, to be in his kingdom, is, or to be saved, it's not to simply have some new thoughts about God, you know, rattling around in your synapses. It's not to have a number of new ideas or certain propositions in your head that you say are true. It's not simply or merely to have adopted a, a new matrix of morality or some new religious system. And it's not to have merely an emotional reaction to something somebody said about some transcendent being. No, no. To be a follower of Jesus is to be a miracle. To be a miracle. A Christian is a miracle. Why? Because a follower of Jesus is someone in whom the spirit of the living God dwells. God dwelling in jars of clay. It is, as the Scottish minister Henry Skugel once wrote, to have the life of God in the soul of man. Like, what a sentence. To have the life of God in the soul of man. Google, who wrote in 1677, 
in this famous book called The Life of God and the Soul of Man, he wrote the following words. He said, Christians know by experience that true religion is a union of the soul with God, a real participation in the divine nature, the very image of God drawn upon the soul or in the apostle's phrase, and he's speaking of the apostle Paul, it is Christ formed within us. See, Nicodemus is like a lot of us today and a lot of people who think that following God is something that can be done in the natural, that it can be done with just the flesh, so to speak. We simply choose and then we do things and we obey and by what we do, by what we choose, then we're, we're just saved. But Jesus says, hold on, a with God life is a gift from above. See, he says when you need to be born again, Nicodemus, the word that he uses there is this word that has a, a few different meanings. The word is anothen in Greek, and it means from above, and it means again. So he's saying, like, you need to be born anew. You need to be born again, and this comes from above. Heaven invades the clay of earth and breathes eternal life into your very being. We are saved by this miraculous union with God because of his breath, his spirit with us. Now, <clears throat> Jesus tells Nick in John 3, 5, he says, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So in my mind, I just see Nicodemus who's like, <laughs> okay, hold on. Um, and, and see, he's not seeing how the pieces fit. And then Jesus sees that he's not seeing how the pieces fit. And he says, hey, how, how are you the teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? By the way, this isn't Jesus being mean. This isn't Jesus just being like, what's up, dummy? Here's what's going on. Like, that's not what Jesus is doing. He's drawing attention to something. He's saying, Nick, you, you should know this and, and here's, here's why. You are, if not the preeminent teacher in all of Israel, you are one of the preeminent teachers. And you know the Bible backwards and forwards. You know the, the scriptures backwards and forwards. And you should know what I'm saying because what I'm telling you comes right from God's word. See, when Jesus mentions water and spirit, what he's doing is he's hyperlinking, connecting what he's saying right there in that moment back to what was said hundreds of years ago to a prophet that Nicodemus read and knew very well. This prophet's name is Ezekiel. And in the book of Ezekiel, he promises of this time when the Messiah would come and do some incredible, wonderful things and God would transform human beings from the inside out. So if you look at this slide... I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but this is the, what Jesus has just said, which we read. Um, and if you look to the right of the first part, that's a reference to Ezekiel, again, a prophet in the Old Testament, chapter 36, where, where he talks about this divine heart transplant. And then if you look at that next bit, that's going to be this hyperlink or reference to Ezekiel 37, and that's where there's this incredible vision of a valley of bones that comes to life, and, and we'll get to that. Um, I promise you, uh, we'll, we'll get to that. But what I do think is worth looking at right now is just the first one, Ezekiel 36. Just let's get it in our minds to help frame where we're going to go and what the Spirit is doing in this world. So Ezekiel chapter 36, again, this is Old Testament, hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus, hundreds of years before this nighttime conversation. This is what it says. It says, I will sprinkle clean water on you. This is God speaking to the prophet about what he's going to do. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all of your uncleannesses and from all of your idols. I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules." So when Jesus is having this conversation, he's already cluing Nicodemus, who knows the scriptures back and forth, into the, the, these verses here. And, and he's saying, Nicodemus, this has been the plan all along. This was, this was what was promised all along, that God would send in, in a, day, a future day to come a Messiah, a hero, who would do something so wonderful that it would rewrite reality. 
that it would change your hearts because he would do something through his, his, his life and, and his sacrifice that would bring new life to you and I would change your hearts from the inside out. This has been plan A. That's why you should know these things. Because so deeply broken is the human condition that what is needed is not simply some more, some more moral renovation, some more moral revolution. Like we need something more than more external laws or, or more than some new thoughts or more than some new emotions to feel. We need a radical cure, right? We need a new nature. We need a new heart. We need hearts of stone that are miraculously changed from stone and, and granite to, to flesh and, and nerves so we can feel, so we can be sensitive to God and live in accordance with him in the world that he has created us. And only God can breathe a stony heart into flesh. And we can't do heart surgery on ourselves, it turns out. It doesn't work that way. So God's spirit within us is what makes us spiritually alive. There's no Christianity without the Spirit of God. And maybe you've heard the saying that Christianity isn't so much about making bad people good. It's about making dead people, what? Alive. Dead people alive. Christian life begins with union with God through his indwelling presence. Now, um, with some of those things already said, here's what I'd like to do. Um, I'd like to show how the Spirit throughout the entire story of Scripture brings life in generativity. So we can see this pattern set up that then is ultimately fulfilled in what Jesus does and with the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost. Um, so, so let's do this. We're, we're going to see how the Spirit uh, brings life throughout the Old Testament, and we're, Old Testament and it's going to lead us into the New Testament. So we're going to do a little rewind, tell the story, and we're, we're going to fast forward to like certain highlight points, okay? So that's the plan. We'll see how it goes. Genesis chapter 1, the story, the very beginning there in verses 1 and verses 2 in Genesis. Over the chaos, over the darkness and the waters, the Spirit of God hovers. The Spirit of God is there to bring order out of the chaos. So you have, you have the Father, you have God the Father there and he's speaking the word uh, with the logos which eventually is connected with Jesus and the spirit. Right away we have this triune God but the spirit hovers over the waters and, and then the word is spoken and then, then there's light. And now form and life come out of formlessness and dark emptiness. The spirit is there. And then you go just a little bit more, you turn just a little bit right in your Bible and God makes Adam and he molds him out of the clay of the earth and he puts his nostrils to Adam's nostrils in this intimate act and he breathes his breath into Adam. Now it's important that we understand the Hebrew word here for breath because it's the very same word for spirit and that Hebrew word is, is ruach which is a super fun word to say, okay? So we're gonna say it. This is the same word for spirit uh, and, and breath. It is this word that, e that, that, that evokes life, the coming of life. So, um, and, and so it's ru, and then, and then it gets like real gnarly. Ugh, okay? It's an, it sounds ugly, but it's awesome. So if you would, put your hand in front of your mouth if you're comfortable, just like an intro, and then just say ruach. Yes, and you, what you feel is the warmth, right? And, and the moisture of, of the life that is with inside you. This is spirit and breath, ruach. Now, the spirit of God brings life. Maybe you should apologize to the person sitting right in front of you. I don't know. <laughs> <clears throat> um, but the spirit of God brings this life. So let's fast forward now to the time of the flood, after the corruption, after the pervasive sin and brokenness of humanity that brings about the judgment of the flood, and after Noah and the crew have floated on the surface of the dark waters for 150 days, the waves begin to recede, and the, the chaos gives way to order. Formlessness gives way to form. The ground now emerges. Ground emerges from the dark waters. This is recreation. This is Genesis 1 all over again. God is recreating everything. But here's the, here's the thing. What causes this to happen in the text? Ruach, a wind. 
God sends a wind and the waters recede. Look at Genesis chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. But God remembered Noah and, and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a ruach, a wind, blow over the earth, and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens was restrained. The waters receded from the earth continually. What is this? This is an image of how the Spirit of God brings life. He brings order up and out of the watery chaos and darkness. Okay, with that piece in place, now fast forward a long time to the Exodus. God's people are in slavery in Egypt. They are under the grip, the steel grip of Pharaoh. But God is bringing them out by his grace through an agent who redeems and restores, and that's, that's Moses. And so Moses takes the people out, and then the, the people find themselves really quickly between a rock and a hard place. They find themselves stuck between the Red Sea, no, no escape route, and they find themselves between that and the war chariots of the Pharaoh who are coming either to destroy him out of anger or to take them back into captivity. They are between a rock and a hard place. There is death on both sides. God intervenes and saves his people. How does he save his people? What does he do? <sighs> yes, there it is. I saw the hand motion. Right? He splits the sea. How? A ruach. A ruach blows and splits to the sea. Look at Exodus 14, verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord, uh, the, the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east what? Wind, a ruach, all night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters, they were divided. He opens a channel of life where there's only death by the wind, the spirit blowing into the situation. Fast forward. Fast forward now to when God's people are on the other side of that sea and are free and they're living and they're traveling through the wilderness. God gives Moses instructions to build a tabernacle. And what's a tabernacle? It's, it's a, a tent of meeting. It's, it's a, a dwelling place where God would dwell in the midst of his people and he would meet them. It's where heaven and earth meet. And in order to make this, what does he do? Well, he gives his spirit his breath, his ruach, to a man named Bezalel. Look at Exodus 31, verses 1 through 5. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the spirit, the ruach of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship to devise artistic designs to work in gold and silver and bronze and cutting stones for setting and then carving wood to work in every craft. God's spirit will be building the place where God dwells so his presence can be with his people in the wilderness and bring them life in a place that should be their death. The spirit brings and facilitates life. Now from there, we're going to hit the fast forward button for a while, and we're going to go to the time of the prophets, the time of the prophets. Those prophets, those people who spoke the word to God's people over and over again saying, you're not living in accordance with God's love and his truth, and it's going to go really bad for you if you keep denying him and you keep destroying each other. And it does go really bad for them. They end up in exile. They've lived in rebellion for a long time. God eventually says, you know what? I'm taking you out of the promised land. And he takes them into uh, exile because of the rebellion. And, and that brings us again to Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel is a prophet who is prophesying during the time of exile when God's people are not in their promised land. How's God going to fix this situation? Because God had made promises that he would be for the good of these people. He would redeem and restore, but it's not looking good. And that's when this prophecy comes to him. And it's so important, I'd like to read it again for our hearing. Ezekiel 36. Here's what God's going to do someday in the future. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. From all your idols, I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit 
I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from the flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, my ruach, and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So that's a big deal. Like God's saying what he's going to do, how he's going to make this all right. And then if that weren't enough, in the very next chapter, we get a, another great visual of this life that the Spirit brings. Look at Ezekiel 37. And I'll start here, verses 4 through 6. Now what this is, by the way, is this is a vision that God gives Ezekiel. And it's a vision of this desiccated, dry valley of death. It's just a valley littered with bones. And God speaks to Ezekiel. So it says, Then he said, God said to me, Ezekiel, Prophesy over these bones. Say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath, ruach, to enter you, and you shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So this is interesting. This is kind of like one of those like uh, PG-13 visions or rated R ones. It's kind of like a horror movie, but in reverse. Because you have this valley of all these bones, and then suddenly they start to rattle and clang and clatter and, and, and clank together. And then in a, in a reversal um, of, of, of the horror of falling apart, you have coming back together. So the bones there are standing, and now the bones are clad with sinews. And then meaty muscle attaches to them. And then they're reskinned. And then you have these beings who are standing there, reconstituted, alive but not alive, like the walking dead. And then verse 9, verse 9 through 10, then he, God said to me, Ezekiel, prophesy, speak to the ruach, the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds breath come from all over the world breathe on these slain that they may live and so I prophesied as he commanded and the breath came into them and they lived and they stood on their feet an exceedingly great army so in other words now there's a valley full of people who are alive because the spirit of God has been breathed into them this is a vision of how God will bring the walking dead to life with his life-giving spirit so that's a brief tour of the Old Testament regarding the Spirit. Um, but this carries on right at the beginning of the New Testament. So, so think about, you know, when Jesus is now being introduced on the scene. The angel Gabriel, remember we talked about this um, oh, a while ago when we talked about how Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary? This angel, this visitor from heaven, comes to Mary and says, here's some wild and wonderful news. You will carry the living God, the Son of God, the Creator, the Redeemer, Restorer within your belly, and you will give birth to Him. And she's like, wow, that's amazing. How? I'm a virgin. And then we get this in Luke 1, 35. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, will hover over you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Just as the Spirit hovered over the waters in creation in Genesis and brought order out of formlessness and brought life to where there was no life, the Spirit of God hovers over the, the waters of the womb of Mary and brings the one who is the way, the truth, and the life into the darkness of the world so that he can bring order to all things. And like the spirit-empowered Bezalel who crafted the temple, the spirit of God knits together Jesus, the one who is fully man and fully God in the womb of Mary, the one who will be the true temple, fully man, fully God. He is the meeting place of heaven and earth. So the temple, the true temple is knit together in the womb by the Holy Spirit. Because the book of John also tells us that the word of God became flesh and what? Tabernacled became that temple among us. So all these Old Testament images are pointing towards what happens with Jesus ultimately. It's brilliant and beautiful. And that brings us now to Jesus, what Jesus says. So um, John chapter 14, Jesus teaches us about the Holy Spirit. He says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. 
And I will ask the Father, he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So there's a few things we can learn here about this Holy Spirit. One, he's our helper. He's a paraclete, one who comes, para, comes alongside to, to be with us. So he's a helper. We need help. <laughs> he's also gonna stay with us forever. He will be with you forever. He won't bail on you when you have a bad day. He won't bail on you when you say something stupid to your spouse or your friend or you do something that you shouldn't be doing. He's gonna be with you forever. He's a spirit of truth. He leads us into what is true about reality. And then Jesus says that spirit is with them at that moment. Why? Because that spirit is the spirit of Jesus and Jesus is with them. And then he says that spirit will then dwell within you. The very spirit of Jesus will live inside of them. So then Jesus tells his apprentices, it's good news. Guys, this is, this is good news that I'm going away. And they can't see it in the moment. But it's good news. And so he continues this line of thought in uh, John 16, picking up at verse 7. He says, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, here's what he's going to do. He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they don't believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father. And then you'll see me no longer. And then concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. So what does that mean? The Spirit will convict the world of sin. The Spirit reveals to us our need. The Spirit opens up our eyes to the brokenness within and without. The Spirit shows us our sinful state. Then the Spirit reveals that our only way out of that sinful state is Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who died for our sins and has has risen from the dead and now sits at the right hand of the Father. That's that's the righteousness part. And then he, he will also convict us of the fact that this Jesus is Lord and he has conquered the evil one, and that is the judgment part, that evil has been judged in this world. In other words, we are blind to our sin, blind to reality until the Spirit opens up the eyes of our hearts. We can only repent and place our trust in Jesus if the Spirit has turned our hearts from flesh, or excuse me, from stone to flesh. Let's not go the opposite way. (laughs) He turns our hearts from stone to flesh so we can engage and have this life of love with him and love others well and this is the spirit of adoption this is the spirit of adoption because it is the spirit of jesus who is the son who cries abba father now we can cry abba father john goes on verse 12 he says i I have so much to tell you i still have many things to say but you cannot bear them now when the spirit of truth comes he will guide you into all the truth for he will not speak on his own authority but whatever he hears he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come and he will glorify me For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. I know that can be a little confusing, to be honest. Um, But what he's saying there is he and the Father are one. And he and the Father have good gifts to give. And the Spirit is going to give those good gifts. And the Spirit is going to apply those good gifts to your life because of my love for you. So what we can learn here is that the Spirit speaks the truth. He shows us again reality and the Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus. He's like a spotlight, keeps turning, turning the attention to Jesus and says, look this way, look this way. You know you have a truly Christ-centered church um, when Jesus is lifted up because the Holy Spirit keeps pointing our attentions to Jesus and then Jesus keeps showing us the fatherhood of God because Jesus the Son always wants to glorify the Father. So the Holy Spirit is the spotlight keeps turning us to Jesus. Now, with that said, I have to be very um, upfront about this. Uh, the Holy Spirit is not a what, but a who. Um, I compared him to a spotlight, but he's a who. Um, it sounds like a Dr. Seuss thing. But he is a person of the triune God. And, and, and it's in the waters, the cultural waters, that the Holy Spirit is, is like something from Star Wars, this impersonal force that you can tap into, that you can manipulate, that you can make do various things if you know the right ways to do it. But the Holy Spirit is a who, a he, a him, that he and him and who, like that's all throughout these, these uh, passages I've just been reading. 
Now, <clears throat> we have to fast forward one more time, and we're getting close to, to, to bringing this um, to completion. Um, but let's fast forward to the book of Acts. And where this is in the story is Jesus has died, Jesus has resurrected, Jesus has ascended, and now um, his people are waiting on him to fulfill the promise that, that he would come and be with them. So Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 says, When the day of Pentecost arrives, 50 days after Easter, 50 days after the resurrection, they were all together in one place. Who? The Christians. They were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as a fire, it's going to get weird guys, as fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And then they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So what's this now? The promised Spirit of God has come from heaven to birth his church, to fill his people with his Spirit. And when he does, do you know what's reversed? The curse of Babel. Remember Babel when, when humanity was fractured because humanity was, was trying to live without God and God confuses their language and scatters them and sends them out? Now God's doing the opposite. The languages are unconfused. People are hearing in their own language the good news about Jesus. He's uniting for himself a people from all the nations because he's healing a fractured humanity because his presence is now with them. So again... To be a Christian is to have the presence of the living God, the Holy Spirit living within us. And he does all sorts of wild and wonderful things in his restoration process. Now there's a lot there. So when you start to add it up, what does the Spirit do? The Spirit of God. Well, he convicts us of the truth teaches us to live in accordance with reality, recognizing our own sin, recognizing that we can only be saved by, by Jesus Christ, recognizing that he has triumphed over all the evil powers in this world. He teaches us to call him Lord. He teaches us his scriptures. He illuminates his word for us. He gives us new life. He regenerates us. He animates our dead hearts that we might come to life. He rebirths us and gives us renewal by the Holy Spirit, Titus 3, 5 tells us. He applies adoption. Romans 8.15 says, You have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Because the spirit of Jesus the Son is in us, we cry out, Abba, Father. We have been adopted into the family of God. He empowers us. He empowers us not just to say, Jesus, you are our Lord, but he empowers us to now live and to love like him, to do the things that we could never do on our own. You know, last night my power went out. And I live off of Vasco and the whole neighborhood uh, went, went out sometime around 10 o'clock. And, and this morning I, I woke up in a daze at four something and I'm just like, I forgot that the power went out. So I go to the light switch and I'm like, tick, 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 tick. like hit it like 10 times. And then I realize the power's out. It doesn't matter how many times I flick that switch, there's no power for that light to come on. We have desires to flick switches of, of love and, and to be these people that we desire to be, but unless the power of the God who is love, the very fountain of all that is love and good and true, unless he lives within us, we are not empowered to do those things. But he empowers us, he lives within us that we might live in miraculous ways and die to self for the good of other people where we would rather have other people die for us previously before his spirit inhabits us. He gives us spiritual gifts. First Corinthians tells us that he gives us gifts for the common good. You all have gifts because the Spirit dwells within you that you are to offer for the good of your brothers and sisters in this room, in this world. He guides us. He prays for us. When we can't pray, he groans from within and intercedes on our behalf, Romans tells us. He transforms us to be like Jesus. He sanctifies us. He bears fruit in us, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And ultimately, he glorifies Jesus. The person of the Holy Spirit is active, friends, in our lives, making sure that we receive forgiveness and joy and the goodness and the strength and the peace of salvation. He applies salvation to our lives. And I know that was a lot 
So here's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to truncate that into this, this, three, this list of three. If you distill it all, the Spirit of God brings newness to us. God has given you a new nature. He renews and he reworks us. Presence. God is present with you. In your most lonely moment when everyone has forsaken you and you are crying on the floor in whatever that the darkest of spots is and you feel like you have no hope, he is with you because his spirit lives within you. And power. God empowers you to live and to love like Jesus. And this is such incredibly good news because this means that we're not locked into our old ruts. Like our DNA is not our destiny. This means that we are not confined or shackled to our family trees or the addictions that keep destroying us week in and week out. We are not stuck. Like we can change. And I think sometimes we just need to hear that. We, we can change by the power of God. We do not have to be who we used to be. I'm thankful that I don't have to be the guy that I used to be. We're not alone. And the miraculous can happen through us because the spirit of God, the resurrection power of God can move through us. We can truly become like Jesus. This isn't just a game that we're playing. It can really happen. And we have an invincible hope because he will be with us forever. Have you ever wanted to change? To be something different. To somehow be someone different than you are, to not feel the way you feel about something, to not think the way the old ruts in your brain keep thinking about things in in broken or or perverted or, or distorted or damaging ways, to not do the things that you keep doing. Have you ever desired for your desires to be different, only to come up against the obstacle of yourself, to come up against the wall of you? Friends, to be human and to change, how, how does that happen, deep change? Well, the heart of the human problem is that we can't change the human heart, which is our problem, but he can, and he does. So we need a new heart of love that comes only from heaven by way of the person and work of Jesus and through his indwelling spirit. So friends, wherever you're at, take heart, because the work of Jesus, because of him, we are now in him, he is now in us. We're given a new heart. The life of God now lives in the soul of man. And that's why we proclaim that we believe in the Holy Spirit. So with that, we are going to uh, recite the creed uh, with one another. Here's what I would say uh, before we do. If, if you're new, if you're visiting, if you're not a follower of Jesus, we're not going to make you do something odd and like hey, you have to confess this. This is for those who, who uh, love and trust Jesus and uh, they want to confess this because it is the, the deep um, trust posture of their hearts. So um, if you would like to confess the creed with us, um, please, let's confess the creed together. Here's what it says. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father Almighty, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen.